family. Mark chapter 2. There are two phrases related to memory that we use in life. Well, we use all sorts of phrases, but I mean there's two that I want to draw upon that we use that are tied together by memory, but we use them very differently. The first phrase is when we say, I'll never forget. It's usually followed by the time, right? I'll never forget the time that such and such happened. And, and we all have all sorts of different things in there. Like if, if I put a survey, I'll never forget. And you'd all have different things that happened. Uh, sometimes it's, I'll never forget where I was when I got the news. And it depends on your lifetime, whether that news was Pearl Harbor or JFK being assassinated or 9-11 or whatever it may be for some of you, all those things. That's one phrase, I'll never forget, and we follow it up. The other phrase is this, don't forget, right? Don't forget to turn off your curling iron. Don't forget to take out the trash. Don't forget, and, and again, we'd all have a whole list of stuff in there, right? Uh, I, I'll never forget and don't forget. And they contrast two things. They contrast the fact that in life things happen that we just are responding to and we'd say, I, I kind of was just a, I'll never forget it. It happened and I'll never forget it. And then there are things in life that we have to be attentive to and be focused on. Memorial Day weekend here that we celebrate and I think about when Abraham Lincoln 1863, stood there on the fields at Gettysburg, and he shared that small Gettysburg address that we have never forgotten, right? Because it, was, it just was this perfectly fitting speech in that moment, and we as Americans look at the Gettysburg address for what he said, and, and we would say, oh, we've never forgotten it, but what's at the center of the Gettysburg address is he says, the world may forget what I have to say. Don't forget the lives that were lost on this battlefield. In other words, uh, we may say, I'll never forget the speech. Not that any of us were there. But what is in the center of his speech is him saying, don't forget what's important. In Mark chapter 2, this is one of those stories in the life of Jesus that includes several of those I'll never forget moments. And yet in the midst of them is the truth that Jesus says to us, don't forget this. And so let's ask the Lord to remind us today. Almighty God, I thank you for your living word. Thank you, Lord. If it weren't for the Bible, Lord God, I could stand here this morning and I could certainly look around creation and praise you for your majesty and for your design i could we could praise you for the conscience you've given us that points us toward the fact that the human race was created with a morality in the image of god but lord apart from your word we would be lost in knowing how the god of all that creation feels about us thank you lord that you have given us your word for us to proclaim to study to look at and for centuries it has changed lives and anchored them and we stand here today and we ask you living God oh living God speak to our hearts today through your living word we pray in the name of Jesus amen I want to read Mark chapter 2 and the first 12 verses and you may have a different translation than mine but you be I don't think it'd be too tough following along in Mark chapter 2, when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Speaking about Jesus, it's, this isn't where Jesus' house was. He didn't have a home there. He was staying at someone's home. It was his kind of home base in Capernaum. Verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins? God alone. 
Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And immediately, he, excuse me, and he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. One of the best things to do when you're reading the Gospels uh, is to try and put yourself in them. So, you know, kind of try and tr try to, even though the Word of God speaks to us in our technological age, to, to kind of sense what's happening, you know, get, your, get rid of the technology, you know, mentally, put on your tunic and sandals, walk the dusty roads, and kind of see yourself there. And if we did that, if we, if we kind of all put ourselves in the story, this passage begins with an event that every one of us would immediately say, and oh, I, I, I'll never forget the time, right? Because we, we read that first event and we would all be joining in saying, I'll never forget the time they lowered that guy through the roof. I'll never forget. I was there too. You know, I, we, I was outside. I was inside. I, we, we, one of those stories that just, when you, when you read it, it's one of those events in life that I'm talking about that you just say it unfolded in front of you. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that day, Right? We read, uh, the, the, we read the details there. Jesus has already performed some miracles in Capernaum. He's already performed miracles. He's already cast out some demons. He's already healed individuals. And if somebody like that is staying in a house, believe me, if somebody did that and they were staying in a house in Maple Shade, it would, that, the house would be surrounded and packed, obviously. Instead of going to a hospital, people would be going to that house. Instead of, you know, that, if there's somebody in that house that is able to do such things, and that's what happened. And the place is just packed tight. Now, some of you are, are pretty relaxed in a crowd. You know, you, you're just one of those, hey, we're all going to get in. Just take your time. And then others of you may be like me, where, well, there's a little spot. There's a spot, you know, kind of kind of get it moving, right? And, and, and you know how a crowd forms and it, and it begins to get packed tighter and tighter as people fill in every little crevice and we kind of like, wait, uh, my arm's there, stopping anybody from coming. But, you know, that, that's what we have. We have a picture of this jam-packed, I mean, they're wedged in the door and, and it's... It's like, I have never been at Times Square on New Year's Eve. I don't know how many of you have. I, I've, I know some people who have been there that have said, uh, they've been there at Times Square on New Year's Eve in a crowd where if you drop something, it, you, put, you better put your foot on it because you're not getting it until the crowd leaves because you're literally unable to, to, to bend over and get down to the ground. That kind of crowd. You can imagine these guys because they're excited they have a friend they love, and, and we could preach for hours on this story, but I can't, obviously, and because there's so many different angles to it, but these four guys have a friend that they love, and he's paralyzed, and, and, and he needs assistance for everything, and they've heard about a man who can heal him, and they're excited, and they're bringing him, and you can just picture it, if you let yourself be there in the crowd, you can picture them coming along with all their excitement, and as they're getting close, oh. They hit reality, right? Leave the house, cars packed, going on vacation, over the bridge on Divine Street. Oh, the Schuylkill, right? I mean, and it's just, and, and, and we, you've maybe been on it where like it's just not moving and you see people trying to be creative, right? And what are they going to do? And, and whoa, you know, where's he going? You know, that, and that's, that's the situation here. It's, Nobody's moving. They've got a guy on a, on a pallet, but why? Because everybody, there are, the place is packed with people who have aches and pains and hurts and they want to get to Jesus. And what do these guys do? They, they head up some stairs to the roof. 
Again, I'm not saying it's a good quality of mine, but if I were standing outside, I'd be, and I saw, I said, where, where are those guys going, right? My son would be saying, dad, 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 just, I said, what do you mean? Where are they going? Hang on a second. Maybe they, you know, right? I, where, where are they going, right? And, and, and to, to find a way in and picture if you're one of the people inside, you're inside, it's packed, it's jam-packed, but you're listening to Jesus. We don't know what he's saying, but you're listening to Jesus speaking. And all of a sudden, somebody starts to dig a hole in the roof. Jesus stops, right? Now, we have to understand so we don't get too horrified. Their roofs were not like our roofs, right? they were easier to repair. So what I mean, this roof was, is probably wooden cross beams and then probably either some, some slates that they just are sliding these kind of pieces of slate aside, tiles, or it's got all these branches and kind of like this, this matted you know, stuff there. Either way, even though it's not too hard to repair, Either way, as, there, as you're standing in there and the place is packed and you can't get any closer, all of a sudden the hole in the roof and there's dust coming down. Oh, people, what, 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 and, and, and you see arms kind of starting to kind of reach in and, and all of a sudden a guy gets lowered through the crowd and dropped in front of Jesus. And there he is, lowered in front of Jesus. I've shared with you before that Every so often, we like to go up to, I think it's Robbinsville or whatever, Di Lorenzo's Pizza up there, and uh, they open at 4 o'clock. And so if you think, oh, they open at 4, well, we'll get there at 4, you're in trouble. Because uh, we went there a couple weeks ago, and um, as we arrived, we thought, oh, boy, because the line was already longer at the door. You know, it's one of those where... Ooh, and the thing is, see, as, uh, y if you get there and you're standing in line, you may count how many people are in line and think, oh, we're all right. But what you don't realize is a lot of those people, that one person has nine people sitting in a car waiting for the door to open. And, they, and you're, oh, right? Oh, you know, and, and people are saving places in line. And, and we were there, and I remember, you know, where some counting, just said, okay, you know. And I was talking to Bob Crane. I said, you think we're getting in, Bob? I think we're, what do you think? I think we're getting in. And he's saying, well, it depends how many of these people have people that are coming. And those people that are standing over there sitting down who think, wow, it was great. They got the seats to sit down outside. Do they realize they're in the back of the line or don't they? And they're like, that kind of thing. And I, we had it kind of pretty much figured out, and we, we got in the door, and as we're coming to the front of the line, I see this big table that's going to hold us. We're going to be okay, right? Because I'm not, I'm, again, you may be so much better than me. I'm not somebody who says, well, if we got to wait another hour and a half or so for the, for the next seating, that's okay. That's just not my disposition, right? But imagine, I, I, I would get to that, ah, and at that moment, Somebody rips a hole in the roof and people, they drop these lines down on the ropes and they're dropping on it. You know, you may be saying, wow, you know what, all the effort they went through, you know. I'd be saying, that's my table, right? They're sitting in my table. What's going on? And, and it just picture inside the room as they lower this body down and there it is in front of Jesus. Jesus has stopped talking. There's dust in the air. There's a body on the ground. There's a couple guys looking down through a, a hole in the roof. It's one of those moments, my point is, where we would all say, wow, I will never forget that day. And, and I'll never forget that day. My, you know, like, whether it's just in amazement or in frustration or whatever, your disposition would have placed you. This was a wow, I'll never forget that moment. And Jesus, as the man's lying there, he immediately speaks to the man, but we want to, we're going to come back to it, what Jesus says, because, well, Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. We're going to come back to that because that's, this is the thing that Jesus wants us to remember. But immediately following it is another one of those I'll never forget moments. Because when Jesus says that, son, your sins are forgiven, it's followed by a second one of those moments, and it's I'll never forget when Jesus read my mind. Because that's what happens. Some of the scribes in verse 6 were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're right. 
by the way. They're exactly right. They're saying there's no way he can forgive people's sins unless he were God. He's claiming to be God. That's horrible. Unless he is. Then it's wonderful. That's what they miss. But, but we'll come back to that. Immediately read in verse 8, Jesus aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves. He says to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? And he goes on to speak what their thoughts were. It's one of these amazing moments. And the language lets us know this isn't Jesus just kind of reading the crowd. You know? We have a, a, a video of our son Vince when he's, he's not yet... He's, he's not yet um, three years old. When we first, when I first was the pastor at Faith Baptist Church, and they did one of these, you know, just fun nights where they were dressing. They, they were, um, uh, what, what, they, they, they dressed him up as me. It was one of these things where kind of like, you know, see the person comes out and what, who are they supposed to be? And so they had dressed at the time I had a mustache. And so my little son comes out of the back room with a Bible in a suit with a mustache. And he's, and everybody starts laughing and you see his face and he's, and the laughing gets louder when you see him go. And at that moment, as I'm doing the video, I realize, oh boy, because this is turning. I can read his face. And as a couple of the people that he doesn't know are going, ah, he just, just, just starts bawling. And, and I, I can't wait to, you know, to be able to someday, you know, show that video at his wedding or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, it, because it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, you can just see his face change, right? And I would have been no genius to say, oh boy, uh-oh, uh-oh, that's not what happens here. This isn't, you don't have the religious leaders and Jesus looking going. It, it, the wording there is this. Jesus spoke the words and immediately he knew what they, th they were thinking and he spoke words to them that made them say, he knows what we're thinking. I like to imagine the rest of their time in that. Like, you know what I mean? I, I remember when I used to have a paper route and somebody made the mistake of telling me dogs know when you're afraid. You know, and I'd be like... I'm not afraid. Oh, no, they know I'm afraid. The dog knows, you know, and that sense of inside, the dog knows I'm afraid. And I, I wonder the rest of the time for the scribes where they're just like, don't think anything, don't think anything. You know, like, just, you know, don't think anything. You know, just what, 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 what were they doing, right? But this, I, 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 I got to keep moving, but it's another one of those moments of I'll never forget the time Jesus read my thoughts. It's followed by another time that we all would have experienced. I'll never forget the day when I saw a paralyzed guy get up and walk. Because that's what we read, what happens, right? We read in verse 9 as Jesus is responding, he says, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. He exercises faith there. He doesn't just keep laying there saying, uh, gee, that's really, that's really insensitive of you to say that to me. No, he believes Jesus' words. He gets up. And it's... It's a moment of awe. Just picture everybody there in the crowd and they see this guy lowered in and they know he's been lowered in because he can't move. He's just lying there and it is such an unexpected physical turnaround that they're just... <sighs> I remember when I was a student at Philadelphia Biblical University and we were in, in a, I was in a dorm and... And it's in Pendell and Route 413 where that crosses Route 1. Any of you who know the area? And it kind of goes around a bend. And at that bend there is, are the apartments that were our dorms. And it's a dangerous bend. There were different accidents there. But one of them that was really horrific happened uh, about 1 a.m. And we were in our dorm. I was still awake and some others were too. And um, we just heard this <laughs> a collision that just was one of those. It wasn't like... Ooh, neat, let's go. It was more, every, just the sense of it, the sound, the collision, just we all, like, just, we were 
it was right behind our dorm, so we just poured out there, and I and I, and we ran out, and there was a two different cars, and they were they, they were far apart from each other. The collision was was violent and sent them in different directions, and there was there was a guy lying in the road. There was a, and I ran over to the one car. Now, when I was in high school. Um, at Maple Shade High School, the trainer, some of you might remember Mr. Vitarelli, Vit, you know, he, he was our, and, and I, I, he kind of took me under his wing, and I, I loved learning first aid, and I, I, I got, I think I got like almost A, a plus in first aid, I was, I'm going to be a paramedic, I think, that, I may, you know, I'm, I just loved all that, you know, ah. and so, um, you know, I, you know, when it, I ran out there, and there's, there's one guy who's kind of, you know, his, 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 his neck looks twisted, he's sitting in the car. I, I don't know whether the window was open or shattered. I know the front windshield shattered. There's blood coming out of his face. He kind of turned just like this to me. It looks like his, his neck is broken. I walk up to, to the car there and I reach to check, you know, and I'm, I'm checking for a pulse on his neck and we're all though, it, it, like, oh, no check. and I just, nothing. And I just remember, I think I was in shock, stepping back and saying, you guys, I think this guy over here is dead. And he opened his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it was one of those, you know, <laughs> right? he opened his eyes and, and I just remember going, ah, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> suffice it to say, I was never a paramedic, right? <laughs> that's not the first reaction that's supposed to happen, right, Brian? And, but I remember, like, in my mind, there's nothing. I'm looking at the way he's twisted and contorted. He's dead. I yell out, he's dead. And whether at that moment he thought, I am, or whatever, I don't know. Like he, he, when he opened his eyes, it, I'll never forget it. I can still see him just looking at me. And I don't know if... He remembers it or not. There was you know, the, this one guy who just ran away. I don't know. But I'll never forget that moment. I can see it as clear as, as anything. And I just can't imagine what it would been like to be standing in that room. And the guy gets up. And he walks. And all of us, I believe, we'd say, I will never forget the time that I saw a guy that had been paralyzed his whole life get up and walk out of a room. I mean, it, it just imagine the crowd. They go from probably being irritated to being in awe. Three, three of these moments here in Mark chapter 2, three of what I would call I'll never forget moments. And yet in the center of them all is... A, is, is what Jesus has for us, I really believe. And he says this to us. I know all the things that happened that you will never forget. But don't forget this. Don't forget to remember this. I forgive sins. I forgive sins. I asked Paul to share a few words. I didn't do it to set this up, Paul. But... Uh, Paul and I went golfing, and a few others, before they moved, whatever, 12 years ago or so. We went golfing out at what, what was Indian Springs. It's now, I think, Eve Shimon's it or whatever, out, out that way. And um, Paul and I were, you know, we, we, we were keeping our scores against each other. And we were on the 18th hole, and he had me by a stroke, I think, or so, and on the 18th down the fairway, it was a wide open fairway, but there was, no, it wasn't, was it the 18th? Maybe it was the 17th, 18th, whatever. There was on the left a small patch of shrubs. And so I said to Paul, hey, Paul, make sure you don't focus on those shrubs there on the left side of the fairway. You don't want your ball going in there, Paul. Everything else is pretty much open, but boy, if it, if it goes into those shrubs over there on the left, you're going to be... And wouldn't you know it worked? I mean, Paul teed off, he hooked that shot, and the ball went, I mean, oh, there was oh, oh, yards of open space, and that ball went right toward those, and right into them. Lost a couple strokes, and um, I beat him. <laughs> and when we, we went down to visit them in West Virginia, 
Paul beat me by about 30 strokes. So it was, it was, it, <laughs> I, so it, that was my, you know, one shining moment. But what was I doing? I was trying to make something small, big to Paul. And I'll tell you, in life, Satan does that all the time to us. He wants to take something small and temporary and say, this is the big thing that you should judge God's love for you by. Look at this. If God loves you, he would show you by giving you a car that you need. If God loves you, he will show you by giving you a boyfriend. If God loves you, he will show you by healing your sickness. If God loves you, he will show you by giving you that job. And don't misunderstand me. God cares about all the details of your, of your life. I absolutely believe that. And he's working in the midst of them. But Satan's saying, take all these littler things and use one of them. If God doesn't do what you want him to do, then he doesn't really love you. And Jesus says, don't forget to remember this amazing thing that I do for you. Don't forget to remember the big thing. That I forgive sins. Here's this paralytic dropped in front of him. Lying there. This man is aching to be able to move and to walk. And everybody around is thinking Jesus is going to say, I'm going to do the greatest thing for you that you need. You're healed, walk. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, your sins are forgiven. I'm going to do the greatest thing that you need, and it's not the ability to walk. Jesus goes right to what it is he wants us to remember. He knows this man would love to walk. And he cares and he understands. And yes, Jesus has the power to heal and to show exactly who he is. But he also knows that this man has a greater need. He needs to have his soul set free. And that's what Jesus says in verses 9 and following when he says, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. In other words, yeah, it's a lot easier for me to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can see that, right? It's a, it, just like it, it'd be a lot easier for me to say, I have the ability to heal you and you have a, a, uh, a headache and I just healed it and your headache's gone. Nobody can tell whether that happened or not, right? It, Jesus is saying, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven? That's what's easier to say. But what's, what's the bigger thing to do? Is that. But so that you know that I have the ability to forgive somebody's sins, you know what? Get up and walk. So that you, the healing, the moment that they go, wow, I will never forget the day he made that person walk. Jesus says, I did it. Certainly he did it because he loves the man and cares for the man. And certainly God's plan for us is when Jesus comes again, there's not going to be us sitting there with cancer and with all of those things, his, his complete redemption for us. But he says, I say, get up and walk so that everybody will know that I can forgive your sins. You think the most incredible thing I can do is heal you, but I'm going to heal you so you know that I'm able to do the most incredible thing, and that is set you free from sin. Don't forget to remember that the greatest need you have is to be set free from sin and death and hell. It is. If we don't see that as our greatest need, if I think, well, I, you, know, I'm, I, I, you know, I look at myself, I'm living a pretty good life compared to other people, I, I should be all right. What I need, what's more important is I need some money to help pay my bills. You're missing. The absolute greatest need for every human being is to be set free from our sin and death and hell. That is our greatest need. And Jesus says, don't forget to remember that. Don't forget to remember that the greatest way I could ever show you I love you is to forgive you of your sins. 
And don't forget to remember that that's what I came to do. It's what I came to do. Lord, do you love me? Because I, I've asked you to, to take away this pain. And, and don't misunderstand me. He wants you to ask him to take away the pain. And he may want to heal you because you asked. Or he may say, no, I, I know that's what you want, but I'm going to use that pain to make you more sensitive to this person in pain. Or I'm going to use that pain to help you uh, anticipate the joy of heaven more than, you know, I, I'm, I'm working. But don't measure my love for you by that. Look at the fact that I deserved to be punished for my sins for all eternity. And he comes with the power to forgive, and he does. Don't forget to remember you've been forgiven of all your sins if you've turned to him. I've shared some stories with you before. I've shared, I, obviously, a lot of the heart of my preaching is related to illustrations and windows because I just see Jesus doing the same thing as he walked and looked at life and Sometimes I'll get a story wrong. I don't, I don't intentionally make one up. You know what, I need, a, I need a good story for this. Let's just say I was in the Navy. You know, I, I, no. But I remember sharing once a story about how my dad, when he was young, he had a dog that was called Pal. It was a whippet. It was one of these race dogs. He lived in a row home on Cornwall Street, in Kensington area. And Pal was so fast they had to open the front door of the house before they opened the back door to let Pal come racing through the house, right? And so on one occasion, he, 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 I, the story I shared was, so they opened the front door and then opened the back door and as Pal came whipping through their small row home, my dad's brother had all of his shoe shining brushes out on the floor and Pal jumped over all of them and out the front door and was hit by a car and was killed. When the sermon was over, my dad said, I just want you to know, uh, you put a couple stories together there. Uh, there was a time when Pal jumped over the brushes. Uh, that was not the day that Pal ran out the door and was hit by a car, right? I got it wrong because they weren't my memories. They were his memories. We read Mark chapter 2 and Jesus doesn't want you to walk away saying, don't forget to remember how that man was forgiven his sins. No, Jesus is saying, I want to forgive your sins. Don't forget to remember that I came to forgive your sins. I don't know how that relates to every one of us in this room. But this amazing truth about Jesus. Maybe it relates to you because you've been downplaying that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, he forgave us our sins. But you know what I'm upset with God about? And he wants you to stop and say, wait a minute, hold on a second. Do you realize what you just, you're upset with me about this little thing and you just kind of downplayed, I have forgiven you of every sin and what it cost me, my son going to the cross, shedding his blood for your forgiveness. Maybe it's for you because you're a child of God, but you have, you, you, you got yourself in the muck and mire of some, some scandalous things that you are doing all you can to hide and to cover, and, and it's ripping at you. He has come to forgive your sins. Maybe you're here and you have never come to Christ before for forgiveness. Wherever you are, I would ask, as I just close now in, in prayer, I would ask you to bow your heads with me as we just ask God to meet each one of us where we are. If you have never understood your need for forgiveness before, maybe in this moment, you know it. You know that God is tapping on, the, on your soul right now. And he's saying, this is my moment with you. And right where you sit quietly in your own heart before God, this is your moment to say, oh God, 
I recognize I need forgiveness of sin. I believe that Jesus went to the cross and carried all of my sin there. And God, today I ask you, forgive me of all my sin. Set me free from it. Set me free. Thank you, God, for showing me your love by putting all of the debt of my sin on Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I put all my faith in you. Forgive me. Maybe you're a child of God today and, and you are needing right now to say, Oh, God, you can read my mind. You can read my hearts. You know, you know where I am and what I go and... Lord, I need your forgiveness. Oh, Lord, restore me. Oh, God, forgive me. Maybe you're here today and, and you've, you've just been making light of his forgiveness. You've been angry with God because of that little set of shrubs over on the left side of the fairway of your life. And you need to say, Lord, forgive me for making this amazing gift a small thing. Lord God, I thank you for your forgiveness. This Memorial Day weekend, we remember the lives who have purchased our earthly freedom. But please do not let us forget to remember the life that purchased our eternal spiritual freedom. Thank you, Lord. For your forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, we praise you. Amen.